Tell me one damn thing that human beings are not suffering. You want the whole damn world fixed before you can be peaceful and happy. In Australia, every day nine people commit suicide. Seven of the men. What happens in their mind for those few days or hours, that is terrible. So how do we navigate this inner turmoil? Unless we do something right now that we bring people to learn to handle themselves consciously, there is no other way out. They must know that in is the only way out. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us here at the Melbourne Convention Centre. <laughs> We're waiting for... They haven't turned on your microphone. <laughs> We've all come here to hear him speak and we can't hear a word. This should be a really interesting conversation. My name's Lane Beachley, you're going to listen to me for the next two hours. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> I could teach you how to surf sitting here. We could do all sorts of fun things. But it's so great to see so many beautiful smiling faces who have made the effort to be here today. Is he coming? Have you been turned on? It's a wrong question. Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> it's that easy, huh? <laughs> because uh, I'm always on. <laughs> Nobody needs to turn me on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just share that gift with us now. <laughs> How do we turn ourselves on? One second. <laughs> Jananam Sukadham Maranam Karunam Milanam Maduram Smaranam Karunam Kalevesha deha Sakalam karunam Samaya dipate Akilam karunam Namaskar to everyone. Lane. You are the champion, so <laughs> you lead. And you are the guru. <laughs> so, riding here in a taxi this afternoon, hmm? I had a, a lovely Indian driver in our taxi. His mm -hmm. name is Suman. He's in the audience here today, this afternoon. And uh, we, he said, uh, I'm, when I drop you to the convention centre, I'm going to park there because I've got a big event to go to. He was very excited. And then one of my passengers said, well, the person who's sitting with the mystic today is in your back seat. He's like, oh my God, Sangu is within me. He made this happen. It was like his energy almost exploded out of the car. <laughs> and that same level of energy and explosion occurred the minute you sat down at the front of this room. It was a whole new experience of a mosh pit. I mean, I'm married to a rock star. I'm used to see people throw themselves at him, but that was next level. People touching you, people crying, people yearning to be near you, to be with you. That's a pretty powerful gift. It's the, their love. It's their love for you. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> <laughs> but how does that... It's silly to ask you how does that make you feel because I know you feel just centeredness in love. but. My question is, why, why do you feel that people desire so strongly to be within your presence, to be within your space, to get so close to you, to touch you, to feel, to be a part of you? So, uh, see, so what is a human being yearning for? It looks like they're looking for different things. Mm. But essentially, whether they're seeking education or wealth or money or relationships or whatever, essentially they're looking for some sense of fulfillment. Everybody believes this thing will do it for me. Somebody believes that will do it for me. So what they believe 
as what is going to fulfill them may be different. But the common factor is they're looking for fulfillment. If you want fulfillment, you know, different people are doing different things. If you do it on the physical level seeking fulfillment, it could be food and sexuality, people are seeking fulfillment. If you do it on the mental level, it could be ambition, conquest or simply shopping <laughs> <laughs> If it's on the emotional level, people are looking for love. So these are all the different ways. See, there are only four things with which we can work. We have a body, we have a mind, we have emotions and we have fundamental energies, life energies. These are the only four ways they can act. So physical things they have tried, it brings momentary fulfillment, but again it's… you're in square one after some time, whatever is ambition, whatever is those kind of things, acquiring things in life, all these things are meaningful only when you don't have it. The moment you have it, it means really nothing. Most people are taking pleasure that somebody else doesn't have it and they still value it <laughs> enjoying other people's failures, you know. <laughs> but essentially, all things that you desire, are meaningful only when you don't have it. The moment you have it, for most people, precious things that they've bought are all like uh, somewhere junk in the house. Hello? How many things that you shopped for have not been touched or looked at for the last six months? That says everything, isn't it? So what is the way to remain fulfilled? Fulfillment not as a goal, fulfillment as a process itself as a life process. So when they find a way, that way can only be inward. So in some way, you're looking there, when you turn around and look here, when you see it's so simple, well, it overwhelms them, you saw. <laughs> you say that the way out is actually within. The only way out is in. There's no other way because human experience, no matter what, whether it is uh, turbulence or tranquility, whether it's joy or misery, agony or ecstasy, pain or pleasure, everything happens from within. There may be a stimulus from the outside, but it happens from within. Mm. Whatever you can instigate with a stimulus, you can also instigate consciously without any stimulus from outside. It's like uh, if you had a car in 1950s, morning you had to push start it. Today your car is self-start, I believe, not your surfboard, but <laughs> cars are self-start. <laughs> yeah. So, the question is this, whatever is your experience happens within you. Do you want it to be in such a way it is on self-start, or it needs a push from outside. When you find a self-start, then everything that you want is right here. You don't have to run after anything. What you do in the world is as it's needed. People keep asking me, Sadhguru, what drives you like this? Seven days of the week, 365 days. I said, nothing drives me, I drive <laughs> Nothing drives me. I'm essentially lazy, but they're not giving me one day break <laughs> The challenge that we have, though, quite often, that when we go within, within is often filled with fear, anxiety, anguish, sadness. So no. how do we navigate this inner turmoil to create inner peace? See, uh, when we say within, where does anxiety, anger, this, that happen? I'm just asking a simple question to all of them. The human misery, Whatever type of misery, these are all different names for misery, unpleasantness. Where is the manufacturing unit for human misery? Melbourne, is it? <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> In your mind. <laughs> so you are just going into the mental space and thinking it's full of all this. No, 
In mind you can do whatever you want, as an experiment right now, if I ask you to close your eyes and think of a mountain, can you do it? Yes. Vividly. You can. Ocean, of course you can do it. Absolutely. So I'm saying, you can go to any place in your mind. People have dreams which are more real than real for many of them. Simply because in your mind you can create any image, that is the beauty of human mind, that you can create whatever image you want. So you can build whatever you want mentally. But if you start believing it's true, then generally this will get labeled as neurotic <laughs> You… let's say you build a castle in the air and you start believing it's true, then you're neurotic. If you start living there, you're psychotic. But a third person will come and collect rent for that castle, <laughs> that is a psychiatrist <laughs> You can build whatever you want in your mind, but you must know it is just a psychological structure. If you start thinking it's real, then you have all these problems, anxieties, fears, depressions, this, that, because you're believing structures that you built up in your mind. you not able to differentiate between psychological structures and existential realities. When you misunderstand your psychological drama as existential, then there is no hope. Hello? <laughs> you should know, I can make anything, I can sit here and fall in love, I can sit here and hate somebody who doesn't exist. Anything you want you can do in your mind, but you have lost that freedom to do anything you want, you have become compulsive as to what you can do. That's the only problem. So this is a journey from compulsiveness to consciousness. So if they've taken one or two steps, they're thinking it's too fantastic already. I want them to walk further, but they want to fall down. No, 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 I want you to… you've taken two steps and if it's feeling so fantastic, if you make the entire journey, journey, how fabulous it'll be, that's what you need to do. Not thinking, this is it, Sadhguru, I got it. That's not the point. Two steps are looking so wonderful, you must go all the way, isn't it? Hello? Yes. I say yes, no? <laughs> Please. So how do we develop that process? How do we create that sense of See, peace? See, always anything spiritual, the word spiritual is one of the most corrupted words. Yes. Because it's been captured by all kinds of people, because spirits means there are some ghosts and goblins, who will come and do this and that stuff, otherwise they are in heaven and they come, whatever. This has been captured. Essentially, let me define this. See, this is physical. How did you get this? When you were a child, when you were born, you were only this much, now you become this much. How did it happen? Just the food that you've eaten, isn't it? It's an accumulation over a period of time. Whatever you have in your mind, that is also accumulation of impressions. Whatever you accumulate can be yours, but cannot be you, isn't it? What I gather can belong to me, but cannot be me, is that so? Hey, I'm talking to you, huh? I'm usually… I'm usually speaking to live people. <laughs> I'm not a cemetery speaker, okay <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we'll just turn your mic off. <laughs> now, the very way you are is such that what you gather and who you are is all mixed up. It is true you gathered this body over a period of time, hello? Yes. It is true all the content of your mind you gathered over a period of time, but now you think it's me. So right now, you know, this vessel has become very famous because it's been sitting next to me for some years now. <laughs> if I suddenly say, this is my vessel, you will say, it looks like Sadhguru has some problem, but everybody says he's wise, so let's listen some more. <laughs> After some time, I say, this is me, then you say, let's go. <laughs> because this is a clear case, hello? If you believe yourself to be something other than what you are, 
That is a medical case, hello? <laughs> yes or no? Yes. So right now that's all that's happened. See, all the countless number of people who walked on this planet before you and me, where are they? Topsoil, oh, oh this also, <laughs> all the best. <laughs> They're topsoil. This also will become topsoil. Hello? I'll bless you with a long life, but anyway you will die, is it okay? Hello? <laughs> it's not my wish, because nobody is negotiating life and death. We are only negotiating little more time. Hello? Little more time we want, that's all. We want all our enemies to die and then die, what do you say? <laughs> all our competitors <laughs> No, my competitors wanted me to die <laughs> <laughs> So, essentially, what we gather, we put it back, it's very simple. But somehow when we sit here, we think absolutely this is me. So once you make this mistake that you don't know which is you, which is not you. I sat on this chair for a long time, then I start thinking, this is me. Just see how ugly it becomes, wherever I walk this seat is sticking to me and it, I walk with it. How ugly it becomes, that's how it is. The moment you get identified with something that you are not, something turns ugly. Because now fears, anxiety, simply, if something happens, there is a problem, nothing happens, there is a problem. Tell me one damn thing that human beings are not suffering. They are not educated, they suffer that. Put them to school, they suffer endlessly. <laughs> if they are poor, they suffer poverty. Make them rich, they suffer taxes. <laughs> if they are not married, they suffer that. Get them married <laughs> I did not say anything. I did not say anything. They are only... <laughs> so you look, seems like you're suffering everything, let's give you death, they'll suffer that. You suffer life, you suffer death, you suffer everything, if it happens, if it doesn't happen, where is the problem? The problem is just this, we have given you, we means nature has given you a very sophisticated computer out here, but you don't know where the keyboard is. So you keep knocking yourself like this, like this, like that, something works. Many times these days all the young people have this habit of keeping their smartphone in their hip pocket and whenever they sit it calls somebody, <laughs> okay? Bum touch, not <laughs> If you keep it here, it calls somebody. Will it call who you want? No, if you want to call who you want, you have to do the right thing. So right now, this is all that's happening with one's mind. The most fantastic faculty that you have, compared to any other creature on this planet, you have a better brain than Moombot. Hello? Some of you are not agreeing. <laughs> you have a better brain than any other damn creature on this planet, yes or no? more complex, more sophisticated, but just see how much misery human beings are manufacturing. If you remove half their brains, they would be peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they're trying to do, this is a weekend, I don't know how you're here <laughs> They're trying to soak their brains in alcohol so that <laughs> Peace <laughs> See, if you take away the potential, the problem is always gone. But is that the way to deal with your life? Take away the possibilities, then problem is also gone. So, how do we handle this? The first and foremost thing is if you sit here, this is the basic program, many of them, I don't know how many of you have been through in engineering, have you? Oh, I don't know, oh, that's why <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few. So the simple process is this, if you sit here, you become conscious, your body is here, your mind is there, what is you is a little away, little space. Once there is a little space between you and your physical realities and your psychological realities, this is the end of suffering because there are only two kinds of sufferings in your life, physical suffering and mental suffering. 
little distance, suddenly they are not a problem. And once you create little distance, the nature of your body and the nature of your mind is one hundred percent clear to you. See for example, you know, uh, whether this earth is flat or round, <laughs> big discussion. For thousand years we've been arguing about this. The man who said it is round was poisoned to death because everybody believed it's flat. It's just then we started navigating the oceans, we saw maybe it is round, but still we don't know. Then somebody took off and started flying. Oh, almost definitely it's round, but not sure. Someone went and stood on the moon and looked down, hundred percent round. Distance, isn't it? If you were walking on this planet, doing no other means of transportation, we were just walking on this planet, we would still be arguing the same thing, is it round or flat? <laughs> Even now if you walk up and down here, your experience of life is it's a flat earth, isn't it? But it's round, we know that now without… beyond any doubt. See, suppose you're… Uh, you just came from Japan, I heard. So, uh, suppose you're going to the airport, you're in a rush, but there's a traffic jam. Now, this traffic jam causes so much suffering. Then somehow you got there, got into the plane and your plane took off. Then you look down, traffic jams look so pretty, red lights and white <laughs> lights. You know, have you seen them from the airplane? How pretty they are, but when you're in it… <laughs> so this is all, your whole mental turmoil, when you're in it, it's like that. If you're little above it, you know the nature of your mind. Dealing with it is very simple. Once you know the nature of your mind, you're a surfer, your body does what you want. That's why you're a champion, all right? There are many people, if you put them on the board, they'll fall all over the place. Mostly. Because their body doesn't take instructions from them, it's as simple as that. Mm. So, shall I check these people, all the people? How many of you can get your right hand like this? Please try this. Wow, not bad at all. <laughs> can you get it here, your right hand? Please try this. Wow, so much control you have. Can you do this? Fantastic. Try to do this with your mind. You want to put it here, it goes there. You want to put it there, it goes somewhere else. You want to put it there, it's gone <laughs> So, when you have a faculty like this, if you want it to go here, it goes there, it's dangerous to live. Hello? Yeah. So this is why so much fear. Because basic faculties are not in your hands. And if I ask you a simple question, all of you, would you uh, like a sharp mind or a blunt mind? Whatever you say yes, no, silence, I'll bless you. <laughs> you want a sharp mind. Once we give you an instrument which is very sharp, you must know how to hold it. Why we don't give a sharp knife to a child's hand? Not because a knife is dangerous, never has it happened, a knife jumped and stabbed somebody. Did it ever happen? Not even down under <laughs> It is only the hand which handles it, whether this knife can be used to save a life or take a life, determines… is determined by who is holding it, right? So the same thing goes for your mind. If you have a very sharp knife in your hand and you are a little la 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 kind, intestines will come out <laughs> Worse than that is happening right now. What human mind is doing to individual people, their own mind, what it is doing to them is worse than intestines coming out, more painful. Hello? All kinds of things. Why? Because if I give you a knife, first thing you should know, which is blade, which is handle. If you hold the wrong end, tighter you hold, more it'll hurt. And if you don't know how to be conscious of how to hold it, it'll… it'll scrape you all over <laughs> so This is all that's happening. When you know all human experience is caused within you, is that so? Once again I'm checking with you. All human experience happens within you. What happens within you must happen your way, isn't it? 
the world will never happen your way, please know this. Little bit your way, little bit my way, little bit somebody else's way, that's how it should be. Everything happened your way, then where the hell do I go? <laughs> it happens little bit your way, that's how. But this one person must happen hundred percent my way. But right now that's the only problem with life, this one is not happening your way, isn't it? If this one happened your way, what is the problem in the world? Whatever the situation, we'll deal with it to the best of our capabilities, that's all there is. Yes or no? Some situations we know how to handle, some situations we don't know how to handle. That's about it. Right now, you may not know what is the nature of your existence, but at least you should know what you're not. Suddenly if you think I'm a flower, there's going to be serious problem. Similarly, the f see, this is happening to you every day. Food appears on your plate. You say, this is my food. You eat it, then you say, this is me. Ridiculous, isn't it? So will we get it now that the food that you ate is just a part of this planet, the soil that you walk upon? Will we get it now or will we only get it from the maggots one day? We'll anyway get it one day, but if we get it now, you can transform your life then you can make good manure. <laughs> anyway, it's useful, I'm saying, to somebody, not to you. <laughs> Please. I just want to go back a little bit where you talked about identifying with certain things, because when we grow up and as adults, we tend to identify with everything because we have this longing to belong. And if we identify with something, so a lot of people in this room identify with what you have to say. You talk about the fact that, you know, to go within is where all the answers are, yet there's 5,000 people in this room sitting here seeking inspiration and answers from you because they identify with things that you say. See, uh, I mean, we don't want to play with words, so to make you understand this, it is not because of what I've spoken, they are the way they are, because of simple practices that they're doing in their life, because it's brought the necessary transformation. Words anybody can say, today you will hear this and tomorrow you will go. The best things have been said to you right from your childhood, from by your parents, by your teachers, by many, many people, isn't it? Great things have been said, but they don't stick because there is… there is no experiential dimension to it. It is just psychological, when something is fresh, it means something after three days you've forgotten what it is, this is how it happens. So because there is a practice, there is an experiential process. With that, you have realized at least a little bit, that realization is always transformative. It's the transformation which makes the difference, not the identity. And what is that practice? What is that process? That as I, as I said, it, we generally call it inner engineering. Because we've engineered the world, see our lives have improved in so many ways because of engineering, isn't it? Today we are sitting in this hall because it's engineered in a certain way. Now, yesterday you're in Japan, today you're here. This is engineering, you didn't swim or surf. <laughs> the airplane brings you. So this must be understood. If suppose you did this hundred years ago or let's say two hundred years ago, you flew from Japan to here, if you claimed you are the messenger of God, we would believe you. <laughs> if you say you are the daughter, there is no precedence, but still we would believe you. <laughs> if you said I am herself, we would still believe you because you flew from Japan to here. <laughs> to but today we know you just flew by an airplane. A very common thing, everybody does that, just a ticket. <laughs> That's all it takes. Yes. So. What you call as magic or a miracle, see, a thousand years ago, if I just had a light bulb, I could claim I'm the messenger of God and people would have believed. Just turn on the light, whoa, the whole population would bow down, yes or no? So what is one man's miracle is another man's engineering. This is called inner engineering. You engineer your, inter you engineer your inter interiority in such a way that it's the way you want. At least you should be the way you want, 
Nobody in the world will ever be hundred percent the way you want. Hello? You can agree with me, hello? Even if you have two people in your family, they are never hundred percent your way, isn't it? That's why most people got dogs these days <laughs> But <laughs> these days even they do their own thing. When they need food, they behave the way you want. Once they've eaten, they behave differently, the way they want. All right. Once I have what I need. So no one, just no one in your life will ever happen the way you want. This one person must happen, isn't it? If this one happened, if you happened just the way you want, would you keep yourself miserable or blissful? Blissful. For yourself, it's always the highest level of pleasantness, isn't it? Sometimes what you want for your, for your neighbor may be debatable. <laughs> but what you want for yourself is always highest level of pleasantness. What is pleasantness? See, if your body becomes pleasant, we call this health. You want it? Yes. See, from now on when I ask you a question, yes, no silence, I'm going to bless you, it's up to you <laughs> Health. Yes. If this becomes very pleasant, we call this pleasure. Yes. Oh, biggest, is it? Yeah. <laughs> they want pleasure. <laughs> if your mind becomes pleasant, we call this peace. Yes. yes. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. Yes. If your emotions become pleasant, we call this love. Yes. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. Yes. If your very life energies become pleasant, we call this bliss. Yes. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. Yes. If your surroundings become pleasant, we call this success. Yes. Only to create only to create pleasantness in your surroundings, you need the cooperation of the world around you, many forces around you. To create pleasantness of the body, pleasantness of the mind, pleasantness of emotion and energy is one hundred percent your business. Pleasantness in the world, you need cooperation from people, otherwise it will not happen. Getting cooperation from various forces and people is a question of skill. Not everybody can do it to the same extent, but keeping this one pleasant is hundred percent possible for every human being. Only thing is they have to become willing. Oh, Sadhguru, I'm willing, but I get angry. No, no, no. See, it is that but, you have to kick that but. <laughs> yes, but if you don't kick that but, it's not going to happen. Yes, I want to be like this, but look at the way she is, I can't be happy with her being like this. There's no end to this. You want the whole damn world fixed before you can be peaceful and happy, you are not going to be peaceful and happy. <laughs> I believe that our lives are a direct reflection of what we believe to be true. So our li if we don't know what we believe, then we can have a look at our lives because they reflect back to us what we believe. Now you were talking about if we focus, when we understand what we want, then we work towards that. But majority of the people that I work with at, through Awake Academy know what they don't want, more so than what they do want. So if we're addressing people's concerns from a place of don't want, how do we get them to connect with what they do want? See, uh, the only thing that human beings want is pleasant experience of life within and around. Just that different people are defining it in different ways. Somebody believes I can be pleasant only if I get a billion dollars. <laughs> so his pleasantness is postponed for a certain number of years or maybe for good. <laughs> so similarly, everybody is putting conditions Sometimes they may be fulfilled, sometimes they are not. If they are fu fulfilled, you will realize it is… it works for some time and then it drops off. So essentially, fundamental thing to understand is human experience comes from within. If you re don't take charge of this, no matter where you are, no matter what you have, you can live in… See, 
recently something happened, people who are living in palaces, literally royal palaces, they committed suicide. They're living in a palace and they're committing suicide. Hello? <laughs> yes. See, the nature of mind is such, whatever you dwell upon, generally it manifests that. If you're dwelling upon, I don't want small waves <laughs> Even the damn ocean will throw very small waves at you <laughs> Yes, I don't want to be late <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> this is what I said, you have a huge computer but you don't have the… Keyboard. Keyboard. So somehow it's working, once in a way it works the way you want. Rest of the time it's in reaction to other things. You must understand, the fundamental aspect of being human is this. You are the only creature on this planet who is referred to as a human being. Umbat, being, just a umbat. Elephant, being, no. Tiger, being, no. Ant, being, no. Only you are a being. What this means is, if you explore the possibility, you will know how to be. If you know how to be, then what is the problem? Right now the problem is you don't know how to be. So, this problem is because, you know, that Englishman Charles Darwin said, you were all monkeys at one time, not me, <laughs> that guy. What were you? Charles Darwin said. Yeah. <laughs> you were all monkeys and then you became human. He also said other things, I'm making it very simplistic. A goat could have become a giraffe over a million years time. A pig could have become an elephant over many more million years of time. But a monkey became a man rather too quickly. <laughs> yes, to a point where anthropologists are searching, for a missing link somewhere. <laughs> Did you find any? <laughs> so, if you look at the DNA science, what the DNA scientists are saying today is, the DNA difference between you and a chimpanzee is only 1.23 percent. 1.23 percent, not much of a difference, isn't it <laughs> So physiologically, that's how close you are to a chimpanzee. But in terms of intelligence and awareness, you're worlds apart from a chimpanzee. So this is your problem. You have an intelligence for which you don't have a stable enough platform. Unless you stabilize this, your own intelligence is going to freak the hell out of your life. We stabilize ourselves through… Yes, self in many ways, you're on a surfboard stabilizing yourself. Yes. It works to some extent, somebody dances, somebody sings, somebody does something else. Different types of activities people use to stabilize themselves. But any activity that you do, how many hours in twenty-four hours can you surf or dance or sing or do whatever? So this is why it is important, you find an inner mechanism which wherever you are, it's always on. If you are doing this with physical activity, you get enslaved to that activity. See, right now, only if I sing, I can be happy. I have to sing, all neighbors will have to wake it. <laughs> I have to sing twenty-four hours, <laughs> all right? Now for you, we have to throw eighty-foot waves all the time. Yes, please <laughs> <laughs> So I am saying any activity that we do, only if I eat this, I'll be happy, we'll have to be eating. Only if I drink this, I'll be happy, we have to be drinking. Anything outside activity, if it decides our inner way of being, we get enslaved to that activity. And no activity is it possible for anybody to keep it on for twenty-four hours all the time. No activity, anything cannot be done unless it's an inner mechanism where you just know how to be. Like breath, it's happening, all the time it's happening. So this is where the yogic systems are important. We start with outer activity, slowly take it inward in such a way, a transition happens where even if you don't do anything, it's the same way. 
But with every other activity, you have to do that activity for you to get that experience. That's a fundamental difference. So, yes, round of applause. So, I think about putting that into context for the children of today, mm -hmm. because w there's a lot of inactivity now with children when it comes to devices and phones. And the yes, thumbs are growing. The thumbs yes, are growing. yeah, the thumbs are getting a good workout. Which thumbs is, up, you know. <laughs> thumbs up, yeah, yeah. Or thumbs down, not good for children. But when we think about the narcissistic nature of social media, for example, and the, the distraction, because it's, it's distracting them from honoring their feelings, being aware of how they feel because they're more concerned about getting shares, comments and likes. And it's distracting them from the nature of who they are. How do we inspire our children to explore the limitless nature of themselves? See, this is a responsibility those of you who chose, choose to become parents have. A child means it's not just a reproductive job. You manufacturing the next generation of people. What kind of people will live on this planet is determined by you now. Very important responsibility, hello? Yes. What sort of people will populate this world in the coming generation is determined by the mothers and fathers of today. When this is the case, it should not be taken lightly. And of course you know that Human beings are not an endangered species. Hello? <laughs> yes or no? Yes. You know that they're not or you… <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. they are not. We are not an engin endangered species. So if you are a tigress, I would say, please, you must reproduce <laughs> because, uh, you know, there is a danger to the species. Yes. We have multiplied manifold. Beginning of twentieth century, just little over hundred years ago, we were just 1.6 billion people. Today we're 8.4 billion people, lot of reproduction. It's not just excessive reproduction, it is just that people are living longer, which is wonderful. So population has multiplied. Essentially we took charge of death. We postponed our death. The average life expectancy of a human being at the beginning of twentieth century was forty-eight years. Today it's seventy plus in most places. So when you live, when you postpone your death, you should also have postponed your birth. But we didn't do that, so we multiplied literally almost five times over in a little over a century. Well, human footprint also has increased in its size, individual human footprint. What a human being would consume hundred years ago, and what we are consuming is massively different. Hello? Yes. See, just look at this. What your grandparents had in terms of clothes, in terms of, you know, automobile or homes or whatever, I think what you have today is at least twenty times over or twenty-five times over. Yes or no? So our consumption has increased and our population has increased. Everybody is trying to control human aspirations. You cannot control human aspiration. People drive an electric car to the office, on the weekend they take out a beast <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> People are doing this everywhere. So, controlling human aspiration is very difficult. But bringing down human population consciously is very much possible. But nobody wants to attempt this because everybody thinks if I don't reproduce his population, his kind will go up. So my kind should go up. Whether it's in terms of race or religion or nationality, we are thinking on these terms. So we are yet to be sensible enough to find a solution. All of us can multiply like crazy and then no place to live kind of situation we can create. We… we are heading for that. All population projections show that somewhere around 2053, the human living conditions will become so bad. It is expected about twelve percent of the population may commit suicide. Yes. How many? Twenty? Twelve percent. Oh, twelve percent? Yes. That's a billion. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Right now, the suicide rates in every country is going up. In Australia, every day nine people commit suicide. Seven of the men. Is, does it make you happy 
<laughs> what are the what so, are the Australian women doing? Uh? Yeah, <laughs> driving our men crazy, obviously. So in India, thirty-eight people commit suicide every day. Mo in every hour, more than one. All right. Mm. In United States, eighteen people commit suicide every day. In most affluent countries, in in Japan. In 2020, when pandemic was raging, more people committed suicide than the number of people who died of COVID. So you don't really need any disease or a flood or a fire or anything, people will do it by themselves. And that number is rising year on year. It is expected by 2050 plus, up to 12 percent could commit suicide because it becomes so horrible to live here and above all mental issues are growing in so many different ways. So unless we do something right now that we bring people to learn to handle themselves consciously, if they continue this impulsive, uh, impulsive and compulsive reactions to life around them, they becoming mentally ill is very much possible. See right now about twenty-two percent of the US population is under psychiatric medication. Recently, the Surgeon General in United States announced that one in two Americans, one in two Americans is feeling lonely. If two of you are sitting here, one of you is feeling lonely, what's happening to the other guy? <laughs> Loneliness is the incubation period for mental illness. Once you start feeling lonely, you are cooking it up. It's just a question of time, just a question of life situations arranging themselves in a certain way. If they become little formidable, you are going towards mental illness. Once you go towards mental illness, suicide is just one more extra step. See, the question is not whether somebody died or not, people anyway die, all right? But what they went through as life, if a man or a woman man or a woman, a human being. Mostly men. <laughs> yeah. She seems to be enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, I'm actually going to a funeral tomorrow no, that, from a friend that's, that… That speaks badly of the woman I in the country. No, not really, it speaks badly of the men because we need to break that cycle. <laughs> what could we do to break the cycle? Why do men feel like they… No, they I'm can't saying maybe the ladies are dra driving them in that direction. <laughs> We're not, I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> you talk of responsibility. In India, there's a law called abatement of suicide. Mm. So you said something to freak somebody and they went and committed suicide, you could go to prison for three years. Really? Yes, abatement oh. of suicide. So don't do, say this in India, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the important thing is, See, somebody committed suicide means somebody died, whatever means. Mm. Death is not the problem. See, the basic instinct of life is you want to preserve this. It's natural whether you're an ant or a human being. This life is the most precious thing, but you want to take it. You know how much suffering should happen? Nobody can gauge this. What happens in their mind for those few days or hours or whatever it takes for them to make the decision, that is terrible, the human suffering, man or woman, okay, it's still okay. terrible, all yes, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> Glad we agree on that. <laughs> so, that much human suffering we manufacture where you want to take your own life. The worst thing is, in 2022, 18,600 children committed suicide in India, below 18 years of age. Of this, 7,600 children were below fifteen years of age. Wow. A child, mm. twelve, thirteen, fourteen-year-old child wants to commit suicide, what are we doing? Can't we see we are doing something fundamentally wrong? A child is an exuberant piece of life. Twelve-year-old, thirteen-year-old has to commit suicide means, do we not understand that we are doing everything wrong? The goddamn life is being done wrong. Hello? Yes. A child. But this is what is happening, this is across the world, there is no exception. Wealthy countries, poor countries, whatever kind of countries, it's happening because 
human software will collapse slowly if we don't take care of certain things. This is why we did the Save Soil movement, because when I saw in the month of January when COP26 happened in Glasgow and I met a few of the environment ministers and when I spoke to them, they, what have you done about soil? They said, what is soil, Sadhguru? What's wrong with soil? We're all talking about oil. I said, what? In, in the COP you, there's no soil? No, we didn't even hear the word soil. Then in March I started one hundred days this, uh, you know, I rode a motorcycle from London to Kaveri. 30,000 kilometers in hundred days. And uh, when this happened, we managed to touch 3.91 billion people, B. And people rose. Once people started speaking, the narrative changed in COP27 in Egypt, we became official observers. In COP28, the soil became the main theme in many ways. They had an event there called Soil the Superstar. <laughs> a non-existent soil became the superstar in two years' time. We are already working with Azerbaijan, which is the next host for COP29, where we will make soil the main theme. Now European Union declared, if you address soil regeneration, thirty-seven percent of climate mitigation can happen. I'm saying, where was it all this time? because everybody wants to hit oil or whatever else, fossil fuels, because there is money in it. Soil, there is no money in it. Nobody wants to talk about it. See, if you want to shift from fossil fuels, I'm not saying we should not shift, we must shift. But if you want to shift from fossil fuels to whatever other things, technological innovations need to happen. Innovations in technology is not going to happen overnight. It may happen tomorrow. It may not happen in the next twenty years, we don't know. Hello? Nobody can time scientific development that in this many years we will produce this. There is no such thing. It may happen, it may not happen. But soil means, agricultural soil we're talking about, this is one piece of the planet where human hand is tending to it on a daily basis. The land that human hand is upon, isn't that the first thing we should change? Hello? Yes. Our hands are on it. Isn't that the first thing we can change? No, we don't want to change that because there are so many vested interests who want to push you away from that. Mm. So this is why it's important at least if sixty percent of the population stands up and says this is… this matters. If all of you every day say something about safe soil, in whatever messages you send, whatever transaction you do, you keep saying it, then it becomes a policy matter, it becomes an election issue, then money is invested, then things will happen. Otherwise, you go and fix your kitchen garden, that's very cute, <laughs> but that's not a solution. Solution is the world's agricultural policies need to change. You say that the pursuit of happiness is tearing this planet apart. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> Everything that human beings are doing is in pursuit of their happiness. Can I tell you a little story? Go right ahead. This happened. There was a potato farmer. One day he felt like eating apples. So he went in search of an apple tree. He found one. Then, being a potato farmer, out of sheer habit, he started digging the ground for apples. When he found no apples, he became furious and dug furiously. After some time, slowly the tree came down upon him. That's what we're doing. Repeatedly I went through this, human experience happens from within, joy and misery happens from within, is it so? but you're digging up the whole damn planet to find happiness. Put it to farmers, digging for apples, this is disastrous. So without a shift in consciousness, once people are empowered with technology and you tell them, don't use it, don't use it, it's not going to work. You cannot stop, believe me. Because with the technology that we have, 
we don't need a billion people to destroy. Ten people can destroy the planet. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. You don't need the whole population to do it because somebody can build a palace which is a billion rooms. People have built thousand rooms, why can't they build a billion rooms? Hundred, two hundred years ago, there are people who built one thousand rooms in their house. Like ghosts, they allowed to walk around, but still, <laughs> they have one thousand rooms because your competition had five hundred rooms. <laughs> if your competition goes on eighty foot wave... Fifty. Fifty foot wave can do that. <laughs> so, uh, this in pursuit of happiness, happiness cannot be pursued if you... Like you said, you're always looking for things that you don't want. You're thinking, I should not be miserable, I should not be frustrated, I should not be depressed. If you just remove what you don't want, see, happiness is not something that you have to attain to. Even as a little child, you are joyful by your own nature, isn't it? Hello? When you are six years of age, somebody had to work hard to make you unhappy. <laughs> Today, everybody has to work hard to make you happy. The whole equation, everything turned around. What happened? See, at the age of six, if you are so joyful, by the time you are thirty, you should have been ecstatic. If you grew up, I'm saying. If the reverse happened, a retardation happened, isn't it? Your body grew, your brain grew, your capabilities grew, but your ability to live, retarded. Those of you who have children, because she asked a question about children, if you have a child at home and you are there, between you and the child, who is more joyful? Who should be a consultant for life? <laughs> Obviously, but the problem with adults is the moment a child enters their life, they think they want to teach something. If a child comes, it's once again learning how to be alive, which you were also at one time. Now, you are acting like you are carrying the planet on your head? No. Hello, is it on your head? No. Nothing is on your head. Simply nonsense because you don't know how to keep your head clean. Yes or no? Nothing has been done about it. Right from the kindergarten to wherever you have studied, it's all about how to conquer the world. You can call it science, you can call it technology, you can call it whatever, but look at the tone of everything. Everything is about how to conquer the world. There is nothing about how I should be, hmm? Nothing. Did you read anywhere in the textbook? How as a human being you should be within yourself? No. Any method? No. So what will you produce? It's expected in another fifteen years' time, fifty percent of the world's population could be diagnosed as mentally ill. Now when you say mental illness, don't think of only those people who are in an asylum or something. If… Shall I redefine mental illness for you, is it okay? Hello? If you are getting angry for three minutes a day, you are mentally ill. If you are getting angry once in three days, you are already on the way. <laughs> because you got angry with somebody just for one minute, they think you are mad anyway. <laughs> yes or no? So, just imagine, people around you, they have come to learn to live with mad people. <laughs> what else to do? Not much choice, everybody seems to be in the same way <laughs> Let, Can I tell you a story? Yes. This happened in Minnesota. This year there's been excessive snow. So a lady was going to a party in the evening and uh, her car, front tire went flat. She's been driving for many years but 
She never had a situation where she has to fix a flat tire. So she pulled out the manual, looked at where the jack is and how to put it, everything she's learning, but she heard weird sounds around her. She looked, here is a mental asylum, a twenty-foot wall. People are screaming and howling from inside. So she got a little scared, then she, the protection of twenty feet wall, nobody's going to climb that and come over. So she started focusing on how to fix the tire, she got the jack out, lifted the wheel the first time in her tire life, she's doing this, somehow got this, it's a heavy tire and wheel and she somehow carried it around, got this. The instruction said when you pull out these four nuts, you put them in the hub cap so that they're in one place. She put it in the hubcap, but she's go she was going to a party. So she's in those kind of clothes where you can ne neither sit nor stand, you know. Oh. <laughs> and she's on six-inch high heel, she's tottering around with this heavy tire and she stepped on the hubcap. All these four nuts flew in four different directions as nuts always do. <laughs> Especially when stepped on by stilettos. <laughs> And it fell into the snow and it disappeared. She removed the main tire, brought the step knee, but no nuts. <laughs> she was looking at it totally dejected, what to do? Then she heard a voice, Hey lady! She looked up on the third floor of the asylum, there's a young man standing there. He said, remove one one nut from all the three wheels, put it on this and you can drive to the gas station. She did just that and she was wiping her hands, looked at him and said, thank you very much, but you are such a smart young man, why are you in this place? He said, I may be crazy but I'm not stupid like you <laughs> So you must make up your mind which one you want to be. <laughs> crazy or stupid? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> because madness is an inevitable consequence of mishandling yourself. When I say mishandling, the first mishandling is you believe yourself to be something other than who you are. So these three boxes you must create in your life. What is memory? Memory is here. See, what is it people suffer? Just look at this. What happened ten years ago? they still suffer. What may happen day after tomorrow, they already suffer. <laughs> yes? Yeah. They are not suffering life. They are suffering two most fantastic faculties of being human, that is we have a vivid sense of memory which makes our life rich and we have a fantastic sense of imagination which allows us to create so many things in the world. These are the two things they are suffering. If they had the brain of an earthworm, they would all be peaceful. Hello? And they would also be eco-friendly <laughs> So, essentially it's the brain. See, about four or five years ago, four and a half years ago I think, there was a young woman in Hyderabad. Anybody? Telugu people are here? Oh! So, she was a television anchor. One day from her fifth floor balcony, she just dump, jumped out and killed herself. She left a note in her house, no one is responsible for my death, my brain is my enemy. To give you this brain, it took millions of years of research and development. You can just dismiss it with one word evolution, but it is millions of years of research and development, isn't it? So much has happened. Wrong things have been done by nature and again corrected, so much has happened to get you to this place and now your brain is your enemy. Look at this. This is the tragedy that the best things that you have, you turn against you. Once your intelligence turns against you, no god or devil can save you. That's the end of it. <laughs> Hello? If your intelligence turns against you, it's over. So why does it turn against you? Simply the fundamental mistake is you are identifying with things that you are not. Once you start that process, madness has begun. Some people will mature very quickly, others will go on slowly. Because people think it's normal to be stressed, they're crazy. 
People think it's normal to be afraid or fearful, it, they are crazy. They are looking for that kind of company, that's all. <laughs> but you must understand, if your mind creates something that you don't want, you are crazy. Suppose your two fingers start poking at your eyeballs. <laughs> you crazy or no? Hello? So if your hand does it, you can see it. If your mind does it, why can't you see? Your mind is poking you from inside. Why can't you see beginning of madness is happening? Whether you will mature or not depends on various situations around you. If this is why everybody wants to meet the best human being on the planet, they don't want to be the best human being, they want to meet that person and screw them up <laughs> I'm just thinking about a, a lot of what you said, Henry, and one of the things that I think stops us from accepting the responsibility or the ownership of the nature of our own minds and the limitless nature of our being is that we can become a victim to circumstance. We allow external circumstances to dictate the quality of lives to us. And I must admit, when I was coming through the professional surfing ranks for probably the first seven years of my career, I was a victim. Every, my poor performance and my results was everyone else's fault. It was the judges or the conditions on my board. And then I realized that the center all of all of that misery and that suffering was me and something had to change. So even surfing causes suffering, I didn't know that. Surfing and suffering, yeah. I was suffering while I was surfing. I thought it's a fun thing. It is, yeah, unless your brain gets in the way, which my brain got in the way of. And then I realized that I had to change and that's what led me to yoga and meditation and visualization and all those beautiful things, so <laughs> namaste for that. But I still felt uneasy, I still felt uncomfortable and I went and did something at 25 years of age, I did a, had an experience called a rebirthing which is literally lying mm -hmm. on the floor and getting connected with your breath, a cyclical cycle of the breath for 45 minutes. And that unsurfaced my fear of abandonment and rejection due to being adopted at birth. Now, and coincidentally, it was the same time that you found your or same age, not the same time, because you're a little older than me, but it was the same age <laughs> that you found yourself <laughs> at the top of Chama. Only by one year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same time that you found yourself on Contemplation Rock and Chamundi Hill, 25 years of age and you experienced that explosion of exuberance and blissfulness. We can't all have a rebirthing, we can't all find a Contemplation Rock, but we can all detach from the victim that we can instantly connect with very quickly because it's familiar and we tend to go towards the familiar versus because it creates that sense of comfort and control. How do we break the cycle and maintain a connection to the positive process of the centeredness and the inner alignment to create that inner peace? So we stop being the victim and we stop projecting and we start taking responsibility, which as you refer to in inner engineering means responsible for responding. Well, this <laughs> we need word, another hour? This <laughs> word rebirthing comes from uh, a term called dvija in India, in that civilization, an enlightened being is always referred to as a dvija. Dvija means twice born. Once you're born of your mother, which was not your doing, it happened. So, second time you're born consciously, which is your doing, if you if you have to be born again, you must first of all be willing to die the way you are. If you don't die, how to be reborn? I'm right here but I was reborn again means it's silly, isn't it? I died in some way. So it comes from that process, let's not discuss processes like that. So the important thing is this, that human beings find endless ways to torture themselves because their source of happiness is elsewhere. Somebody else, something else is the source of their joy. Now there is no end to this. 
because you can never have that somebody or something hundred percent in your control. Every small thing will freak you. <laughs> about… about your success, see that is a competence issue. Even if you did not become a champion, you could still enjoy surfing, all right? Becoming a champion is a question of competence, application, devotion to what you're doing. I keep repeating this word because the word devotion has been captured by religious people, which is a very wrong thing. Devotion means unfaltering involvement with something. Whether it is sport, art, music, spirituality, business, politics, whatever it is, if you are not devoted to it, you will not do anything significant. Mediocre things you may do, you may earn a living, but you won't do anything significant. To simply balance on that motorless silly board <laughs> it takes a lifetime of devotion. Hello? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. Simply kid stuff, but to do it well, it takes a lifetime of devotion, otherwise it won't happen. Anybody can do a little bit. But to do it in a certain way, it'll take a lot. See how people are struggling to hit a silly sitting ball in a golf game? <laughs> do you think it's some great circus? Sitting ball, you can't hit. I keep telling them, if you can't hit a sitting ball, what the hell can you do in your life? <laughs> so, but to hit a sitting ball properly, the way you want, takes a whole lot of work. Simply to hit it any way you can, but to get to that place that you do it just the way you want it, that takes devotion. It will not happen with concentration, it takes devotion, absolute involvement. Why I'm saying this, that religion has hijacked this word is people think devotion means going to a temple or church or some place like that. No, no. Nobody has done anything significant in this world without being devoted to what they're doing. Now, because you're talking responsibility, this whole movement is a movement from religion to responsibility. What this means is, religion means responsibility is up there. Responsibility means it's here. You must make up your mind. You must make up your mind because you're playing tricks. If you absolutely believe everything is done by God, let me see you leave your life to Him, leave your house unlocked, leave your safe unlocked, throw your money on the street. If God wants to give it to you, He will give it to you, otherwise He will take it anyway. No, everything you take care, what doesn't work belongs to Him. I'm saying, unfortunately we're playing tricks with ourselves and thinking we are doing something very pious or sacred, please come to senses. I'm not saying there is no value at all, there is, but if you're that kind, right now it's you not willing to hand over anything to God. You're trying to make a deal. Dear God, I'll give you ten dollars today, please I need one million dollars in the lottery. <laughs> Try this, I'll give you ten dollars. You go outside in Melbourne, wave it at anybody who was on the street, I'll give you ten dollars, please give me a million, they'll slap you in the face <laughs> But you think the source of creation is such an idiot that he will make a deal with you ten dollars to a million? <laughs> what makes you think? See, if you don't believe in anything, if you pay attention, if you had pay attention to a leaf, a flower, an ant, a grasshopper, anything, don't want big things, small things, if you pay enough attention, whoever made this, brilliant, isn't it? Hello? Absolutely brilliant or no? But we did not say God is intelligence. We said God is love because you're bereft of that. We said God is compassion because you're always a helpless creature. Whatever is a source of crea creation is brilliance, isn't it? At least if you imitate that a little bit, the world will be better. Obviously, you didn't create this nor I created this. Hello? We didn't create this. Whichever way it happened, brilliant or no? 
neither the religious people nor men of science know where this cosmos begins, where it ends. But we are busy making silly conclusions as to how it happened, who did it. First thing to understand is, this creation is not human-centric, that is the biggest mistake we've made. Every other life is far more important than you. This is what… why this whole soil movement is, a handful of soil in southern India would have eight to ten billion organisms in it, one handful, over fifty to seventy-five species of organisms. They are the foundational life. Even your body, right now in your body, sixty percent or more of it is just microbes. Only forty percent is your parental genetics. If they freak, you're finished. This is what is happening to the world, that on an average, twenty-seven thousand species of organisms are going extinct every year. As this progresses, first software will collapse, then hardware will collapse. We are heading that way. Those who are in touch with natural elements are a little more sturdy. Those who are not, slowly dissipating. Why? When everything is better than ever before in terms of comforts and convenience, yes or no? Everything is better than ever before. Hundred years ago, how people were living, how we are living, everything is better in terms of physical comfort and convenience. But why so many people are losing it? This is it. This is one of the important aspects. There are many other sociological reasons, that's a different matter. You cannot fix the sociological reasons overnight. Hello? You cannot. You can wish for it, but it's not going to happen. But there are some things we can fix. This is a whole thing. What we can do, we will not do. What we cannot do, we dream about it. You need to come down to realities. The reality is this, if you conduct your body well, you will be healthy. If you conduct your mind well, you will be mentally healthy. If you conduct your surroundings well, you will be socially well. If you do silly things, things will happen to you. You can look up and pray as much as you want. This happened in Tennessee, you know our center is in Tennessee, it's a very religious place. So there was a very pious religious man who went to church not just once a week, every day he went. And he was always very poor, he prayed and prayed, dear God, Tennessee lottery is over eight hundred million. He prayed and prayed and bought tickets and tickets, nothing happened. Then at last he went. When he went there, he sought appointment with God and said, I want to meet. He met. He asked, Oh Holy Father, why did you keep me so poor like a church mouse? I prayed to you every day, I did all the right things. But my neighbor, he's an atheist and he eats and drinks and fornicates and what not. But he's well to do. Everything is good for him. Why this? So God said, he doesn't bore me through the day like you <laughs> So, <laughs> responsibility should be here. My life is my responsibility. This doesn't mean you created the creation, no. But creation has been done, management is still yours, isn't it? Hello? Management is still yours. So everything that doesn't work there, everything that works here is not going to work. <laughs> Unless you make it oh. I've been <laughs> I thought I'd been I have been How about that? Maybe we should open for questions. Yes. Namaskaram Sadhguru and you've spoken a lot about a few... I'm statistics. sorry if I spoke too much <laughs> <laughs> You've spoken about a few statistics about the future and that it might be quite a difficult place to live. And I wondered how do the young people maintain hope with all those difficulties mm -hmm. in the future? See, I don't like any kind of predictions because predictions are being made on cold facts. Predictions are not taking into consideration what is beating in the human heart. So, if all of you come alive and decide, in Melbourne, we are not going to be sick mentally, can't we make it happen? 
So this is what is needed. We sit around and say, oh, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Of course it'll happen. Because we are talking about human societies. Tomorrow's society will be the way we make it today. If there is a commitment in us, we can make sure as a part of this, this year we are launching what is called as miracle of mind. This we want at least three billion people to practice in a matter of eighteen to twenty-four months. This will roll out sometime in September. What this is about is minimum fifteen minutes a simple practice. At least three billion people on the planet, if they close their eyes for fifteen minutes and does something about themselves, twelve, fifteen varieties of things we'll offer, some are physical, some are mental, some are sound-oriented, music-oriented, variety of things, something you do for your well-being, fifteen minutes a day if you commit. You could bring about a change because we know people are still hesitant about that till they get into a mess. We are offering a reward. We are trying to put together about two hundred and fifty to fifty major brands in the world where I'm saying for example, let's say Adidas shoes. Adidas, okay, let's go with that. If you're below eighteen years of age, if you do ninety days of inner work upon yourself, they'll give you five percent discount on the shoes. I'm not saying this is the number, but some number they'll arrive at because this is a business proposition. Let us say uh, uh, some car like Toyota will give you ten percent discount on their service, but you are driving a Honda. Now they are nudging you to buy a Toyota because I'm trying to say this is not charity, this is a business deal for them to bring loyalty with their customers and build new customers. So if you are over eighteen years of age and below thirty years of age, if you do it for hundred and eighty days, you get that reward. If you're over thirty years of age, if you do it for three hundred days, you'll get that reward. The reward is just an add-on, but the biggest reward is you're mentally healthy. Hello. Yeah. While the microphones move around, I had a question for you. Can I ask you one more question? Well, I thought I'll read a poem for you. Oh, you've written a poem yeah. for me? Okay. <clears throat> because you asked me the first question, I didn't get the poem at that time. That's true. This is… A, it's titled as In Love. The beautiful weed-covered pond, the beautiful weed-covered pond, as I gaze at this seemingly still surface, as I gaze at this seemingly still surface, a fish plonks out in delightful effort in search of sunlight or air. I do not know. A fish plonks out in delightful effort in search of sunlight or air. I do not know. Splashes back into the pond, a momentary breakthrough for light and life, spectacular sight of spirit. Splashes back into the pond, a momentary breakthrough for light and life, spectacular sight of spirit. But the sound, it shattered my heart into a million pieces and scattered across. But the sound, it shattered my heart into a million pieces and scattered across. I do not know who I love or don't, but for sure in love. You have a question, is it? Well, it was to the, quest to the words, I don't know. Hmm? The words I do not know mm -hmm. are the door to seeking and knowing. So my question to you is, what do you not know? <clears throat> See, if you look at anything on surface, it looks like we know almost everything because we can consult Google and we know Galaxy Z163, how far away it is, whatever the number, ten million light years. It helps in a… in a tea party because you're not going to go there anyway, nor your friend is going to go and check out whether it's ten million or eleven million <laughs> or it's… What doesn't difference? matter, this all empty stuff. But if you look deep enough, you can't know one leaf in your lifetime. So the question is only, 
how profound is your vision? So if you look deep enough, you don't know a damn thing in the universe. We don't know a single atom with all this scientific exploration, we still do not know what is one atom. We know how to use it, break it, fuse it, but we don't know what it is. So this is the nature of life. The more you don't know, the more it means you're profound. Beautifully said. Microphone right here in the front. Namaste, Namaste Sadhguruji, Namaste. Um, my question is how to tune or prepare your mind for the certainty of death, for your close ones, your family, um, something that we all know is real, but to come to terms with it during the process of life, after especially uh, mid-age life, how does one live with that fact? See, the biggest problem with most human beings is they think other people die. <laughs> they don't know this will die. You know those dying people, they die. No, no, you and me die. Right now we can say we are living or we can say we are dying actually, it's the same term. Right now we are dying. The process will be complete one day. We hope to kick the can, but we know we are dying. If you know you are dying, everything in your body is speaking this language, it is dying. It doesn't matter how energetic you are, how exuberant you are, still it's dying, isn't it so? If you pay enough attention. So instead of trying to make a philosophy out of death, you must pay little more attention to the life that you are then you know clearly you're dying. And everything in the body is programmed and prepared for that, except your silly mind. And that's what you want to prepare, I understand <laughs> But everything in the body, every cell in the body knows it's dying and it's preparing for it. And of course it's trying to buy a little more time. Yeah. I need to capture that. <laughs> <laughs> what are you capturing now? <laughs> that moment <laughs> where I became aware of every cell in my body. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this, uh, this happened uh, in 2020, just before the pandemic, three weeks before the pandemic, there was a book that was in the writing process or in the editing process for almost eight years. Usually that's not my time scale but somebody was editing it, taking <laughs> limitless amount of time and uh, they keep coming back to me, one more question, one more question, one more question. Then I said, it looks like this is going to be a memorial book <laughs> <laughs> Then uh, in February 2020, I said it must be published now. They said, no Sadhguru, there's some, some more work we need to do, we need to do this, we need… This and that. I said, no, it has to go now. They said, why? we waited so long, some more little thing, Sadhguru, just spent three days with us, we'll put it together. I said, no, it must go now. Then the pandemic broke out, the book got published and pandemic broke out and death was all over the place. It's very important that, you know, especially Western societies have made it like it's a taboo to utter the word death. No, no, everybody should know that we are mortal because it's a limited… essentially mortality means it's a limited amount of time. If you know it's a limited amount of time, you would organize yourself for that. If you think you're immortal, you would live a stupid life, yes or no? So how do I prepare? See, when it's close, if you try to prepare somebody, they will get paranoid. Because you must understand, everything that you think is me is going to go right now. Your body is going to go, your thoughts are going to go, your emotions are going to go, your personality is going to go, your house, your relationships and the works, your job, everything will go. 
So when you… everything that you know is going to go, just an empty space seems fearful. You can't prepare against that. If you allow me, I, I'll share something which happened. You know, when I was about two, two and a half years of age, for some reason my mother was unwell and so I went and lived with my aunt for about nearly two years, maybe a little less than two years. She was only eighteen years of age, she was just married and she was an exuberant, joyful, loving human being. She took me as her own and uh, not as her child, I became her buddy. So she took care of me while well, I was there for nearly two years and then I came back, but we maintained that relationship more as a friend than an aunt. Very joyful, exuberant, loving human being. Everything in her life well, so her children came and you know, the usual things, uh, boys went to America, girls got married as they wanted, whatever, whatever Indian dream happened. Small aberrations maybe, but nothing major, everything went well. When she was sixty-nine years of age, she got some tuberculosis in the brain and uh, they said she has just a few months left. She lost it. It was so painful to see her, such a joyful, exuberant human being, suddenly she lost it completely. And then she passed on like that. Then I saw, this is what spiritual process means. That means something beyond your physical and psychological space, there is another little space. Once you have this little thing, suddenly losing the body, losing the mind is not such a big issue. You have a place to stand. If you don't have that, then suddenly everything looks like hopeless, just threatening. So this needs to happen. As a part of this, we started in southern India what is called as one drop spirituality. Everybody must have at least one drop spirituality. They don't have to become, you know, enlightened and knowledgeable and stuff. At least one drop, something more than the body must be with you always. If that is not there, when the time to lose this comes, you become desperate and it's natural. So this is very important. Thank you for that question. It might be a little bit of a long question, I'll uh -oh. try to read it. Um, so we spoke about the human suffering and at the same time that we are capable of our own inner engineering to mm -hmm. achieve what we want and make the world around us the way that we want it. And there's also another concept of being surrendering to what is and self-acceptance, given that when we are still expecting something even from us, that could also create inner conflict. If we don't get that, then we're also in suffering. So I'd like to know your view on how to keep that balance between, you know, surrendering to what is and also being able to, you know, achieve what we want and be more balanced. See, uh, these are all words that have been used extensively, but let me ask you a simple question. How many of you are really capable of surrendering yourself to something or someone or whatever? Please tell me frankly. Be truthful about this. Anybody? No. Then why are you talking about things that you cannot do? <laughs> You're not willing to do, all right? Don't talk about such things, it's a waste of time. But you can transform the way you think, the way you feel, the way you conduct your life, the way you breathe, the way you sit and the way you surf. It's we can true. transform that. Yeah. I'm sure you thought many people who don't know how to stand on the floor to stand on the board. Yeah. <laughs> <All right? laughs> many people can't stand on the spinning earth, they have trouble. But you can train them, you can improve. You can improve the way you think, the way you feel, the way you conduct yourself. 
every aspect of your life can be improved. But surrender is a, simply a big word without meaning because first thing is you're not willing to do and even if you try, you're not able to do. That's a fact. Am I correct or is there somebody that I'm missing? Mm. This is a fact with most human beings. See, these are, these are all things which are used in a certain context. When you use it out of context, it's very different. There are people like this, yogis, who have completely… They don't even eat everything, somebody has to take care of them. In a way, a child has surrendered to you, you can think, an infant. But no, try not to give them something that they want, they will bite you. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Even if they don't have teeth. Yes or no, mothers, I'm asking you. Ah, those little guys are not simply easy <laughs> Nobody has surrendered. I want to surrender. This itself is a bad idea, isn't it? If you got so overwhelmed by somebody's presence, maybe there are moments when you almost don't exist. If we want to call that surrender, you can, but I would leave it without calling it anything. It's just a beautiful mom moment when your nonsense was not active <laughs> It happens when you're surfing, it happens. It does. When you're kicking a ball, it happens. When you're singing or dancing, it happens. Or if you're capable, it can just happen sitting here. See, these days I'm not getting any time, <laughs> but if I close my door, some days, four or five days, I don't read, I don't look at the television, I don't even look out of the window. Four or five days, I don't have a single thought, I simply sit there. Because being alive is a far bigger process than your thought process. Hello? The life process is far bigger than your thought process. But because you went to school, and maybe you got a PhD, I don't know. You think your thought process is bigger than the universe. Hmm. See, right now, today, just I'm informing you all of you news if you've not seen, there have been no major accidents in the many billions of galaxies. You didn't get the news? <laughs> Nowhere there's been any major accident, everything is flowing smoothly. And in this universe, there's been no major trouble, everything is going well. In this solar system also, planets, nobody went into each other, everything is going fine. So everything in the whole cosmos is going fine. But you are sitting here and you have one nasty thought in your head. <laughs> and you think it's a bad day? It's lack of perspective, isn't it? Hello? <laughs> <laughs> In this limitless cosmos, <laughs> everything is going well. One bad thought, one nasty thought and you think it's a bad day. The problem is you must understand in this universe, in this cosmos, this planet is a tiny speck. Hello? Australia is a super micro speck. In that Melbourne is a super, super micro speck. In that you are a big man. <laughs> this is not a simple problem. This is a very big problem <laughs> So you have to get the perspective. You are less than a speck of dust. Tomorrow morning if you, me and everybody disappears, everything is fine. Hello? Mm. In the creation. Our life matters to us, that's a different matter. But if we lose perspective, we'll do all wrong things about ourselves and everything else. True that. So to respect everyone's time, I will just ask the last question. And my last question for you is, you've instilled so much inspiration and wisdom upon the audience tonight. What is the one most important thing everyone must do before they walk out of this room? What they should do? Mm. I know you don't like telling people what to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they must know that in is the only way out.
how how they find the way in is up to them. If they need help, we can offer, otherwise they can find their own way. But in is the only way out. There is no other way out. And so, with that, you say enlightenment is not an attainment or an achievement, it's a homecoming. And mm -hmm. I would like to thank you so much on behalf of everyone here today for bringing us all home. Thank you. Namaste. Mm -hmm.